This is by far the largest uh, da uh, data structures class I've ever had, and that's a great thing. And uh, I'll spend a few minutes telling you about the course. My only concern at the moment is that programming or computer science is like a muscle. And if you don't use a muscle for a long time, you get some atrophy. And I'm guessing the majority of you have not spent your summer programming. So you have taken a little bit of a step back or a half a step back. And so my goal for today is to lecture for only about 20 to 25 minutes. And then we're going to go into the lab. And then I'm going to try to get you recalibrated on programming again. We'll do some simple loop exercises and stuff just to kind of get those programming muscles reawakened. And then we can move on from there. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about the course also. Um, you're welcome to bring your laptop computers if you like. I think we will be doing most of the work in the lab, but last year I had a much smaller class and they just kind of decided that everybody would bring their laptops and work here instead of going in there. And if this class decides the same thing, that's fine. But if even one person is missing their computer, then I got to bring you over to the lab and, and work there to make it sort of fair. Okay? All right. So um, let's see. Uh, most of the students that take CSA are interested in a STEM career, and 25% of them go on to major or minor in computer science. Here, experience shows that the majority of you will major or minor in computer science uh, when you get to college. But it doesn't really mean you have to, because if you're doing any kind of a STEM career, I think you'll find that there will be some element of programming in it. like. I'm hearing a lot about computational biology now. That's like a huge thing. There's actually a major called computational biology in a lot of universities now. And I think most of the other STEM careers are in the process of merging with computer science. So regardless of whether you choose to major or minor or just do a STEM career, I think you'll find this course extremely useful. Um, I've made some significant changes to the course this year versus last year. Uh, also, I wanted to introduce. Um, Where's my TA? Oh, Mr. Milan Sharma will be TAing for the course this year. So congratulations to uh, him and uh, us for having him be big difference when we have a TA in the course. Anytime you need help, you raise your hand. And if I'm busy, Milan will come and help you, not just today, but every day. Um, because we've moved over to a block schedule, that has allowed me the opportunity to really rethink the course a little bit. And I was thinking of rethinking the course anyway, but this kind of forced me to do it. And I want to tell you a little bit about how the course is different this year versus previous years. I think you're going to like the differences. And um, let me just describe it to you by looking at our textbook. Um, Millen, can you just shift the camera slightly so that it's looking at this board instead of that board? OK. so. And you'll have a chance to look at this when we go next door. But if you have your laptops open, go over to westhillcs.com. And if you go over to here are the nine courses in the academy, and here we are in data structures. And this is the online textbook right here. Uh, and you can see that it's got these uh, topics over here. And um, let's have a look at some of these chapters. This topic called the leftover uh, Java. Um, now, it, where'd it go? Uh, OK. So uh, in previous years, uh, I've taught this as the first topic. And it's taken like three weeks. It's taken like three weeks of school to get through. But I've taught most of this to you last year at the end of CSA. And one of the things that was my goal was to get this out of a data structures course, because none of it has anything to do with data structures. Now, the only things that I did not get to last year in CSA were these two topics, String Builder and Enum. And we're going to spend some time on those. I'm not sure exactly what sequence they'll be in, but we will cover those topics. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go on to the next unit over here, which will be some really important stuff that we need to go through uh, about writing classes and abstract classes. These topics, many of them used to be part of CSA, um, but because the College Board made the CSA curriculum simpler a few years back, they kicked these topics out. And we need to put them back in, because we need to understand these topics in order to do data structures properly. 
In previous years, these two units were so large that they consumed the entire first quarter. And so data structures was really only quarters two and three. So we would do all this stuff first quarter. We would do actual data structures quarters two and three. And then quarter four, we would cover something called functional programming, which we still cover. But because we've done a lot of this stuff already, and I'm trying to shrink some of this stuff, I really want to get to the data structures before the end of the first quarter and do more of it in this course, because it is a data structures course. The structure of the course in the past has usually been me lecturing for 20, 30 minutes, then you start your project for about 15 minutes, and then you work on your projects at home. I'm going to change the format of the, of the course a little bit, and my goal now is I'm going to typically lecture for 30, 40 minutes, and then I'm going to give you about an hour to go next door and try to do as much of the lab as you can in the lab. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reduce the amount of time you have to spend outside of class finishing your projects. But unfortunately, I can't contain the entire course during the class time. There's still going to have to be some time you're going to have to dedicate outside of the class time to finishing your projects. Okay, But the, but the, but the, the course is being changed in such a way so that you have to dedicate less of your outside time to the course because it was just became too much. It just became too much. Too many projects. Students started falling behind. They started copying each other's work. It just became unmanageable last year. So I'm trying to simplify slightly. OK, so that's, that's one thing. Now, uh, uh, let me start off by uh, telling you a little story. I'm not sure if I told this story in CSA, but I'll, I'll tell it to you again. Um, one of my favorite teachers was my math teacher in fifth grade, Mrs. Davis. And she was about 4 foot 11, and she was older and had these Coke glasses. Um, didn't see very well, but she was just a remarkable, remarkable math teacher. And um, she instilled a love of mathematics in me that, you know, it's like 50 years later, and I still love the math. Um, so I'll tell you a little story about what happened with Ms. Mrs. Davis. So one day I, I raised my hand innocently enough and I asked Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Davis, uh, are there any, um, do, do negative numbers in math have square roots? That's what I asked her. I remember it was fifth grade, right? And so she looked me right in the eye and she said, no, negative numbers in math do not have square roots. How can something multiplied by itself give a negative number? And I said, oh, yeah, well, I guess that makes sense. And then I moved on. And then two or three years later, I'm in like seventh grade, and I'm flipping through a math textbook. And what do I come across? I come across imaginary numbers. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. Mrs. Davis lied to me. Did she lie? No. Well, sort of. Why did she lie? Well, first of all, let's put something out of the way right now. Uh, Mrs. Davis was God's gift to math teachers. Do you think it's possible she did not know about imaginary numbers? No. Not possible. Okay, even though she was a fifth grade math teacher, she knew about imaginary numbers. Why did she tell me there were no square roots or negative numbers, even though there were? Yes, sir. Mr. F. Sorry. She didn't want to confuse me because I wasn't ready to handle the reality of the situation. She knew that down the road, she would find out what I, she had said to me was wrong, and then later on when I was a little bit older, I would be more prepared. Plus, like there were other kids in the room, it, it would have just caused mass confusion in the classroom. So she intentionally deceived me a little bit, not maliciously, but she had to do it for my own good to protect me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so with that idea in mind, let me show you some stuff from last year. Okay, let's look at this for a second. And these are some really important tenets that we learned in CSA. Strings are immutable, variables should be private, methods should be public, remember that? Constructors should never be private, right? Java, the methods have parentheses, nouns have no parentheses, remember we learned that? We learned uh, array lists allow for elegant insertion in the middle of a list. Array lists grow and shrink as needed. Remember we learned that? And we learned that computers are good at doing several things at once. Now, can anyone tell me what is 
common with all of these things here that we learned in CSA. There's something they share in common. Anyone? Take a whack at it. They're all not true. OK, so part of what I have to do this year is I have to unteach you some of the stuff that I taught you in CSA because you just weren't ready. But now you are. And so I have to go through this. Now, some of these are sort of half true. Like, yeah, some strings are immutable. But there's a whole bunch of strings that are not immutable, that are mutable, called string builder. And we're going to learn about those strings also. And we'll talk about when we use an immutable string versus when we use a mutable string. Okay, there's some t reasons to use one versus the other. Other things like this, <clears throat> this we will completely destroy. Okay, we'll come across lots of variables that should be public, and we will come across lots of methods that should be private. Okay, that's, we, we didn't do that in CSA, but you'll see good reasons for doing that. And likewise, all of these have several reasons why they're either completely untrue or at least partially untrue. Okay, so all these things have to kind of be relearned by you a little bit, and that's what we're going to spend a good chunk of our time doing this year. Okay? Okay, so uh, my goal for, t does anybody have any questions? Anybody? Anything? No? Um, there's only one rule in my course. That rule is, please do not hand in someone else's code as your own. Okay? Now, Last year, I spent a considerable amount of my time building up some tools that will help me detect if you are cheating by handing in someone else's work. Now, I should also mention some, some of the projects will be partnership projects. And if that's the case, you're, it's perfectly OK to hand in the same code as your partner. It's not OK, though, to hand in the code that belongs to another group. Yes? Are we using the CS autograder thing this year? Autograder, yes. We'll use some of that also in some of the projects. And uh, we'll, we'll go through that also. Um, so last year, uh, what happened was after the kids graduated and left, I retroactively looked at their projects and used some of my new tools to figure out how much cheating there was going on. And what I found was that over the course of the year, the, the cheating basically went like this. And what ended up happening was I realized I gave so much work that the kids fell so far behind, they just kind of felt helpless. And they just started copying each other's projects all over the place. So I'm going to dial back the workload a little bit. But in return, you have to promise me that you're going to do your own work. And any time you need an extension because you've got something else going on in another class, you just email me. Not the day that it's due, though, ahead of time. And I'll give you a one-week extension on any project you want. You can't do that every project. But once in a while, I get you have other classes going on. You've got athletics. You've got band practice. You've got whatever you've got. And you need time. And so I'm happy to give you a one-week extension any time you want it. OK? So, but in return, I really, really am trying to find some avenue for reducing the cheating and, and making sure you remember, you're literally paying me to come up here and teach you this stuff. It's like you sign up a membership for the gym. You walk into the gym. You don't want someone else lifting the weights. That doesn't really help either of you. So well, I guess it helps that person. But anyway, you, you want to do your own work. That's, that's the only rule I have in this class now. And if you feel like you're getting overwhelmed with work, you let me know. And I'll try and figure out if I can dial it back some more for the whole class. Are we all OK with that? OK, great. So most of the stuff that we're going to do here, uh, after we go next door, we're going to sign up for some websites that are going to be useful for us. And one of them, Mr. F. Sorry, already mentioned is the CS Autograder. And if you have your account from last year, you can simply add on the Data Structures course now. Alternatively, if you've forgotten your password, unfortunately, I can't reset it. You may have to create a whole new account with a new email or some such thing, and then add the data structures course. OK? And um, I don't know, did I post the school code and the data structures code on Google Classroom? Does anybody know? I'll do that also when we go next door. 
another site that we're going to log into or create an account for is this one. Okay, and you can think of this as coding bat on steroids. Okay, it's like coding bat on steroids. Now, coding bat is, you remember coding bat? We'll do some of that also, by the way. Uh, coding bat is built as an educational tool to help you practice your programming. This is a site that is used by professional programmers to practice coding ahead of a coding interview. Okay, so imagine that somebody with a master's degree or a bachelor's degree in computer science wants to practice their programming before they walk into Google for a three hour coding interview. They go on here and practice. My point is that the problems on here are really, really challenging. Okay, so we're only gonna do a small fraction of these problems, but this will get you up to that next level. And if you feel that Mr. Sarkar is going too slow in this course and you want some more really challenging practice, that's the place for you, okay? So that's gonna be uh, another thing. Uh, I can't think of anything else that we need to sign up for at the moment. You're gonna end up having to bookmark this, uh, this site here, and so we'll be on here uh, f fairly frequently, and all the projects are listed on here also, so that'll be good. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a project to do, and uh, we'll have about a ha an hour to do it. And I just need to explain the project, then we'll go next door and we'll work on it. And I've never given this project before, so it could take 10 minutes, could take two hours. I don't know. We'll figure it out. And if you finish early, then you'll have some free time. Otherwise, keep going. I want to mention that if you don't finish the project today, you have to finish it for homework and you have to show it to me at the beginning of next class, which is in two days, right? Okay, so here is the project. So I would like everyone to take out a piece of paper, if you have one, and a pen. And if you don't have paper, I think I have some here. Uh, Mr. Millen, uh, can you switch the, the, the yeah. camera back to the uh, other board there? If you need paper, I'll leave some up here. And um, we'll do a brief review of something you learned in geometry class, and then we'll put a little computer science spin on it. And then I'll ask you to go next door. Uh, let me just ask one other question. Is there anyone here who did not learn IntelliJ over this summer? Anyone? Everyone did the summer assignment, learned IntelliJ? We will only be using IntelliJ this year unless you have a preference for Eclipse or some other, but we won't be using BlueJ. Um, it's just not a commercially viable system. Uh, by the time you graduate from my class, I think you will find that the demand for your services in industry will be quite significant. Um, given what's going on in the for example, we still haven't been able to replace Ms. Tennant or Mr. Kolb because you can't find computer science teachers. They're all out in industry making big dollars right now. So after this course, you will be worth some money, hopefully. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to draw a point on your paper here somewhere on the top. Like, let's say this is your paper over here. And then what I want you to do is I want you to think about a locus of points, locus of points that are two inches away from your point. So I want you to draw all the points that are two inches away from that point. I want you to draw them on the paper. See if you can remember the locus of points. This is a concept that was taught probably in pre-algebra or geometry, I don't know which, somewhere. Locus of points, two inches away from that point. So find some point that's two inches from that point, put a mark there, then find some other point that's two inches from this point, put a mark there, and try and find all of them. See what kind of shape you get. Yes, sir. Two inches, uh, 10 millimeters. Circle, okay, very good, sir. So the locus of points that's two inches away from this point is gonna be a circle with the center being that point. Makes sense, right? All these points are gonna be two inches away from that point. We're all good? Okay, now I want you to imagine a slightly different scenario where you're in New York City. Now, what I'm gonna show you is a concept 
in computer science that is known under two names. It's either called the taxicab distance. And some people call it the Manhattan distance. But basically, it means the same thing. Okay? I want you to imagine these city blocks. Now, in Manhattan, I think the avenues take much longer to cross than the streets. But we're going to just pretend that they're equal and just make these like squares. Just let me just, they'll just be squares. So imagine these are all squares here like this. Okay, so here's the square. And I'll put in some more here. Uh, I want you to imagine that you are here, OK? And here, let me draw another row over here. And I say to you that we want to find all the locations that are three blocks away, three blocks away. So let's just draw some more over here, OK? Now, in uh, mathematics or engineering, we have this thing called the crow's fly distance. Let's talk about that for a second. Crow's fly distance. Okay, so for example, if this is my house, right, there's my house, and this is your house, right, this is your house over here. Uh, if I wanted the distance here, the crow's fly distance, I release a crow from over here, the crow flies zoop, like that, just flies, and it doesn't matter if it's over water, or mountains. Grass, paved road, doesn't matter. Just crow just goes zoom like that, right? Now, obviously, if you're going to drive this, that's not the way you drive it, right? You've got to drive like on the roads and, and like that and like that. So you can see that the crow's fly distance and the driving distance, the driving distance is always the same or larger than the crow's fly distance. You see that, right? OK. So now we're going to talk about uh, this driving distance, right? And we want to know all the places that we can go in a taxi cab where we can pay them to drive us for three blocks. Okay, so one way we could do it is we could go this way. One, two, three. We can go there, right? We can go down here. Uh, draw another, another row here like that. We can go this way. One, two, uh, three. We can go here, right? We can go up. One, two, three, we can end up over there. We can go here, one, two, three, we can end up, one, two, sorry, three, here. We can end up over there, and you can probably find some other ones. Like, for example, we could go one this way, and then two down, right? We could do that, right? So there's another one here. And then we could also go, like, two over and one up, right? You see that, right? So my question to you is, if I was looking for the taxi cab distance to be three units away from my center point, what shape would the locus look like? It wouldn't be a circle anymore. So I want you to try and draw that on your paper and try and figure that out. And then when you're done, compare your locus of points with the person sitting next to you and see if they ended up with the same geometric shape that you got for your locus of points. Mr. Millen, can you do me a favor, sir, and make sure that my recording is still running here? Just have a look and see if the numbers are increasing. Okay, very good, sir. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Ms. Teleska, what kind of geometric shape did you end up with for your locus of points, Miss? Mr. Shalson. No. Uh, Mr. Mariak. Just like a rhombus. It's a diamond shape or a rhombus. That's right. So it should look like this. Maybe this is what you meant. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Okay, so it's like a diamond shape. This is the locus of points when we get to 
taxicab distances or Manhattan distances. These two mean the same thing. You with me so far? Okay. So now, instead of showing it to you visually, let's look at it with some numbers. Let's go with some numbers. Let's say I give you a center. Let's say the center happens to be 0, 0. We'll start with an easy one, right? That's the center. And I want to generate all the points that are a taxicab distance of three units or three blocks, I'll call it. How's that? Three. This is too early in the year for a marker to die. Where's my? Someone has stolen my garbage can. This is just not right. Someone has stolen my garbage can. All right, here we go. Uh, OK, so we have this uh, point zero, 00, and we want all the points that are three blocks away. Can someone name one point that is three blocks away? Just one point. Yes, Mr. Ajoji. Zero 03. Zero 03 is part of the answer list. Anybody want to take a whack at another one? Yes, sir. 3-0. Three zero. Three zero. You write them all now. After you've done them all, count how many there are. I don't even know how many there are. Compare how many you got with how many your partner got. Three blocks, exactly. It's a locus of points three blocks away. Can you move around? Like, like if you, if you want. No. Mr. Mulcahy, sir, how many answers did you get? 12. Okay, I think 12 is the right answer. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, what I want you to do is, when we go next door, we're going to write two small programs. The first program is we're going to initiate either on the computer on the desktop or on your computer. We're going to start up IntelliJ. We're going to create a brand new project. We're going to call it the Hello Project. And we're going to create a Hello World pro program. So you're going to just code hello world and you're going to run it and you're going to show me that hello world is running on IntelliJ on either your machine or on the lab machine. That's the first, first, first assignment, okay? Now, the second assignment is I want you to create a little method that generates these points and prints them out. Got that? So basically the method will look like this. I'll call it the taxicab locus, right? So you'll have some, uh, some class. So we'll go public uh, class. Um, we'll call it uh, taxicab, I guess. And then in here, we're going to have a main method for testing, right? Um, we really should put the main method in a different class, but we'll get sloppy and just throw it into the same class just to kind of make it easy for today. And then we're going to create this other method called uh, locus or something, right? And 
basically, how many how many parameters should this method have? What do you think? One, two, sorry, three. Why three? Because you have the, the start points and then how many blocks away you're trying to okay. get. Okay, int x, int y, and int d here, okay? So x, y is the center and d is the distance in ca taxi cab distance, okay? And what this thing is going to do is as it encounters one of the answers, it's going to print it. I don't want you to save the points in an array list or an array and then print them later. I want you to print them as they show up in your answers. Okay, so you're processing the data. Oh, here's an answer. Print it. Okay, uh, maybe we'll get fancy. We'll print the uh, the coordinates like this. Okay, so you'll replace x and y with the actual numbers. Okay. Remember, everything is integer here because we're doing city blocks and there's no like half a block business. There's none of that, okay? So basically, this is what I want you to write. And in order to test this out, we'll try a couple of different scenarios. So first time we'll call it, I'll tell you what, let's make this static so it'll be easier to write, right? So public, what should this thing, what kind of return type should this thing have? Who remembers? Huh? Void. void. Public static void. Because it doesn't return anything, it just prints the answers. You just call it, it just prints the answers. Okay. So uh, and then we'll try a couple of different ones. We'll try calling it. We'll call it locus with zero, zero, and three. That was the one I gave you to do by hand, right? And then we'll try a harder one. We'll go locus. Uh, oh, I don't know, three, four, and we'll say uh, two. And then we'll try one really hard one. We'll go locus. These are just some test cases I'm making up, minus 4, 7, uh, 4, like that. OK, so we'll try those be our test cases. Now, your output and your partner's output may not match exactly because the order in which you find the answers doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. OK, but you need to find all the answers and print them. Does everybody understand what the assignment is? One last thing I got to tell you is that uh, I am almost 60 years old now. And when I come up to your monitor and you have Darkula on, it doesn't work for me. So I need you to turn off. You can use Darkula. I know you like the Darkula. You can use the Darkula. But then when I come and grade you or you ask for help, you need to turn off the Darkula. So when we go in there, I'm going to show you how to quickly turn off the Darkula. OK, let's go next door now and settle in.